This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 80, Christian Paz. On January 26, 2020, Texas mom, Sarah Lang, was at work when she received the phone call every parent dreads. Her three-year-old son, Christian Paz, was being rushed to the hospital, unresponsive. Two days later, Christian was removed from life support and died in his mommy's arms. Sarah's boyfriend, Logan Harville, was charged in Christian's death, and Sarah's two older children were permanently removed from her custody because authorities believed she was aware that Logan was abusing her children. In today's episode, I'll tell you the story of a smart, beautiful little boy who loved trucks and had his whole family wrapped around his little finger. You'll also hear my conversation with Christian's maternal grandmother, Jennifer Owens, who wants her precious grandson's death to be a cautionary tale for all of us. This is the tragic story of Christian Paz. Let's start things off with a quick patron shout-out. Thank you so much to my newest patron, Tamara from Cambridge City, Indiana. Thank you so much, Tamara. If you'd like to support the show and help me keep the weekly episodes coming, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. Thanks, everyone. We've all heard the story over and over again about mom's boyfriend being responsible for the death of her child. I've told more than a few of those stories right here on this podcast. A 1985 study by Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, titled Child Abuse and Other Risks of Not Living with Both Parents, stated, If their parents find new partners, children are 40 times more likely than those who live with biological parents to be sexually or physically abused. According to a 2001 study in Child Maltreatment, the presence of a non-biological father figure in the home should be considered a significant predicator of a future child maltreatment report. A 2002 study in Pediatrics found that the risk of fatal child abuse increased by eight times for kids living with adults who weren't related to them, primarily in households including biologically unrelated adult males and boyfriends of the child's mother. A 2005 study published in the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics discovered that children who live in homes where unrelated adults spend significant amounts of time are nearly 50 times as likely to die of inflicted injuries as children living with two biological parents, according to NBC News. Eliana Gill is an internationally recognized expert on various forms of therapy and working with traumatized children. In her words, it comes down to the fact that they don't have a relationship established with these kids. Their primary interest is really the adult partner, and they may find themselves more irritated when there's a problem with the children. Please don't get me wrong. I am absolutely not saying that every non-related adult is a danger to every child of a single parent. I myself have a wonderful stepmother who became involved in my life when I was still a child, and she never mistreated me in any way. She's still one of my favorite people. I know there are plenty of other families in which children are treated wonderfully by their parents' new partner. It's just that on this podcast and on SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com, I've covered countless cases of children who have been abused or killed by someone either dating or married to one of their parents. And because of that, I think it's worth delivering those grim statistics. Unfortunately, what I'm about to tell you is one of those stories. Let me tell you the heartbreaking story of a little boy you'll find it impossible not to love. I urge you to look at the Facebook photo album I've created for this episode, because one look at this little angel's face will show you exactly what I mean. On Sunday, January 26, 2020, 28-year-old working mother of five, Sarah Lang, received the phone call that changed her life forever. 
While she was at work, Sarah's boyfriend, Logan Harville, was watching her three-year-old son, Christian, and two of his older siblings. Logan, Sarah said, called her at work to tell her he had placed a call to 911 because Christian wouldn't wake up. In fact, he told her that Christian was found unresponsive. Christian was rushed to San Antonio's University Hospital. On Monday, January 27, 2020, he was officially declared brain dead. The following day, life support was disconnected, and Christian Alexander Paz, who was born on October 26, 2016, died in his mother's arms on January 28, 2020, at the age of three. 29-year-old Logan Wayne Harville was arrested by San Antonio police on Monday, January 27, 2020, and charged with injury to a child causing serious bodily injury, which is a first-degree felony. According to court records, the magistrate also issued a no-contact order directing Logan to stay away from Sarah and two of her children. Logan, who was accused of abusing not only Christian but also his older brother and sister, was held in the Bear County Jail on a bond of $150,000. Early on Tuesday, January 28, San Antonio police executed a search warrant at Sarah's apartment on the city's northwest side in connection with Christian's death. News media watched crime scene units entering and exiting the apartment, walking out with small paper bags of evidence. Christian's autopsy was conducted on Wednesday, January 29th, by the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, which reportedly told the family prior to the autopsy that Christian's entire body is evidence. His death was ruled a homicide caused by blunt force trauma to the head. According to Mary Walker, who was a spokesperson for the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, said the Child Protective Investigations Division was also investigating Christian's death. Our focus is on any children who may be left in that home or may have been placed at risk. She added that there were no prior investigations by the department involving Logan, Sarah, or Christian. In the meantime, Christian's family mourned the loss of their beautiful little boy. His mom, Sarah, told news station KENS5, My world feels so empty without him. Sarah told the reporter that she grew up with Logan and she felt she knew and could trust him. She said her heart went out to Logan's mother. I am not the only one who lost a son. It's unthinkable that someone you care about, someone you know, someone you trust, could do something like this to your child. But what sucks most is that the statistics I rattled off earlier bear it out. Dating as a single mother is no picnic, but it's made infinitely scarier by cases like this, which just prove it's all but impossible to trust anyone outside your family with your little ones. No one loves them the way your family does. Sarah told Telemundo San Antonio, I have the greatest angel watching over me right now. He was so smart and so beautiful and just this wonderful little light. I loved him so much and I still love him so much. I would trade it all just to have him back, even for a second. About Logan, she said, We had gotten into a fight. He was talking about leaving. I get a phone call talking about my son's non-responsive and I walked into the ER and looked at my son laying on that bed getting chest compressions I never expected anything like this to happen he should probably go on suicide watch seriously in a statement the family told the media he was a sweet loving brilliant funny baby with big brown eyes and anime hair our hearts are shattered he is so very loved and missed after Christian's death, his older brother and sister went to stay with Sarah's mom, Jennifer Owens, and her husband, Chris, the grandparents Christian called Gemma and Grumpus. The week after Christian's death, Jennifer told News 3 KBTX, He had never been more than arm's length away from anybody that absolutely adored him. It's so not right that somebody could see that perfect, sweet little boy and hurt him. They're so loving and sweet, and I can kiss all the boo-boos. I can, you know, well, except that one. Um, I, I help potty train. I, I, I'm a safe place for them. In addition to the oldest, a boy I'll call J.L. and a girl I'll call T.L., Sarah also has two other children, a pair of twin boys who live in Abilene, Texas with their dad. Just one more heartbreaking detail in a series of them. Christian's uncle, Sarah's brother, Alex, was deployed with the Navy at the time Christian was injured. 
Jennifer said at the time. My son wants to come home. He used to rock this baby, and he is his little buddy. The baby lived with us for two of his three years. Sarah's sister, Catherine, set up a GoFundMe to assist Sarah with funeral and memorial costs. The campaign ultimately raised $5,560. Christian was survived by his parents, Sarah Lang and Samuel Paz, three older brothers and an older sister, grandparents Connie Paz, Jose Paz, Jennifer Owens, Chris Owens, and Jeremy Lang, Aunt Catherine Crisp, and uncles William Roseberry, Vincent Paz, and Travis Lang. After I first covered Christian's story on the blog in early February of 2020, I received the following wackadoodle email from someone purporting to be a neighbor of Christian's. I was searching to see if they charged the mother yet and instead found this. From everything I witnessed, the mother killed the fucking three-year-old, you idiot. She neglected her son. I witnessed her. From my understanding, the boyfriend was always at work, and me being the neighbor who was almost always outside. How the fuck do you think you can get off writing this blog? What you should be writing is how the fuck can she be in a vehicle with her crackhead brother, smoking a blunt, and her three-year-old is on the stairs, struggling to come down and find mommy. When she is told that her three-year-old is on the stairs by her neighbors, quote, it's okay, he does that all of the time. Sounds like some of the emails I talked about in last week's episode, doesn't it? The second I pressed send on a response that was much more polite and thoughtful than the original email, it bounced back as undeliverable. I'd love to know where that neighbor got their information, which, from everything I've been able to discern, was completely untrue. Christian's visitation and memorial service were held over Valentine's Day weekend of 2020. Hillier Funeral Home, located in Bryan, Texas, did a wonderful job of honoring this precious, beloved three-year-old boy. They posted photos of the service on their Facebook page, along with the caption, We had the honor of celebrating our little hero, Christian Paz. Christian was quite the comedian, always telling jokes and laughing. His favorite colors were blue and red, and he had a knack for remembering everyone else's favorite color, too. Christian loved watching PJ Mask, playing with his Hot Wheels, learning, coloring, dancing, and singing, especially the Baby Shark song. Christian was a delight to his family, and the memory of his joy and warm hugs will forever embrace our hearts. Love you more, sweet angel. Earlier in February, a fundraiser was held at Wheels Tavern in Bryan to help Jennifer and Chris care for Christian's oldest two siblings, who lived with Sarah and Logan when Christian was killed. Later in this episode, Sarah's mom, Jennifer, will give us a lot of valuable insight into the healing process the surviving kids have gone through since their baby brother's death. On February 19, 2020, Sarah appeared in court regarding custody of her two oldest children because attorneys for the children alleged that she knew her children were being abused by her boyfriend. Alana Pearsall, attorney for Christian's older brother and sister, said, Mom was at work. She came home. She knew the kids got beaten up. The older brother was bleeding when she came home. She patched up the blood and went back to work, and that's when the three-year-old was murdered. Sarah was not criminally charged. The children remained in the care of their grandparents, Jennifer and Chris. Just last month, Sarah and her family finally saw justice for Christian a year and a half after his death. On Tuesday, August 10, 2021, Logan Wayne Harville pleaded guilty to his single first-degree felony charge of injury to a child causing serious bodily injury, accepting a plea deal and thereby effectively putting an end to his legal case. Present at the Zoom hearing were Judge Catherine Torres Stahl, the defendant, Logan Harville, from Bear County Jail, his attorney, Tony Jimenez, Bear County Assistant District Attorney Kristen Mulliner, court staff, and, to provide victim impact statements, Christian's maternal grandmother, Jennifer Owens, and his paternal grandmother, Connie Paz. The range of punishment for Logan's charge, if tried and convicted, was 5 to 99 years or life in prison and a possible fine of up to $10,000. By accepting the plea agreement, Logan waived his right to a jury trial, instead entering his guilty plea directly to the judge. In return, he received a finite sentence of 40 years in prison and a fine of $2,000. He was given credit for time served. He is also forbidden from contacting Sarah, Jennifer, Connie, and Christian's father, Samuel Paz. Another stipulation of the plea agreement was that Logan has no right to appeal his case, so at the very least, Christian's family can do their best to move forward without worrying about constant legal maneuvering by the Cretan who stole their precious boy's life. After Logan's sentence was delivered, he was forbidden to speak while the victim impact statements were given. 
I've edited the following statements only for time, not for content. Jennifer Owens spoke first, also speaking for her daughter, Sarah, who was not present at the hearing. Mine's going to be a bit lengthy, and for that I apologize. But I'm going to be speaking uh, today on behalf of my grandchildren, my daughter, my husband, my mother, and myself. There, in my words, are the only way I can convey the pain we all endure every day. I asked and what they would want everyone to know about how life is without Christian. Says it's painful and lonely without Christian. He also wanted you to know, Logan, that you're a jerk. At this, Logan, wearing a blue face mask, a headset with a microphone, and an orange jail jumpsuit, looked down and nodded almost imperceptibly. Jennifer continued. Said it's been hard without Christian. My husband says he knows what you've got coming, Logan, and you deserve it. Let me get Sarah's part. Sarah says, how am I supposed to put a lifetime of grief onto paper? I have written and rewritten this paper numerous times, trying to put words together in the proper order to express the grief, anger, and hatred that I feel. One thing that I have come to realize out of everything that I will miss, Christian's future is what she will miss the most. He was meant for great things in this world. But what is the point of saying how amazing Christian was? You don't care. You've never cared. If you did, we wouldn't be here. I hope you enjoy where you are. You deserve so much more than this. You should have been in the box my son currently rests in. And I hope it eats at you every second, every hour, and every day that you live. For my part, I cannot begin to explain with words what it's like to help an eight and nine, now nine and 10 year old grieve. The hours spent in counseling with investigators and doctors, I can't ever get those back. There's a true horror in their memories that is what you've done to them. They were terrified of you just as you groomed them to be. I tell you this, had I known, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to kill Christian. I can't adequately express how hard it is to watch my daughter's face when she says she deeply misses the part she didn't get to know, Christian's future. Even with all the time we've had in therapy for trauma, I find myself swallowing the screams of my anguish and despair. It's because I have one nagging thought that I can't shake and one I want you to ponder, Logan. What was Christian's last conscious thought? Did he realize he'd never see mommy and daddy or again? Much less Nana, Uncle Vinny, Gemma, Grumpus, and Uncle Alex? You groomed my grandchildren to not tell what you were doing to them. You held power over them and taught them fear. I hope and pray that someone much bigger and with much more power does the same for you. I pity you because somewhere along the way, your stupid effed up family forgot to teach you that children were to be cherished and loved and not hurt and killed. I will do everything I can to make sure you stay in prison for all 40 of your years. And know this, it isn't all of the justice that will be meted out to you. Next, after a few technical difficulties, Connie Paz gave her statement, and it was equally heartbreaking. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to express my thoughts and feelings regarding the murder of my grandson, Christian Alexander Paz. By making this impact statement, I hope to convey to Mr. Harville what he has taken from me and how his actions have affected me. Mr. Harville, on January 27, 2020, you took a very precious, loving, kind, intelligent, headstrong, fun-loving, and energetic three-year-old beautiful baby boy from me. You took the one person in this world who calls me Nana with love in his heart and joy in his voice. And in your selfish action, you took all that away from me. 
and you replaced it with unimaginable pain, anguish, anger, and an emptiness in my heart that I deal with every single day. Christian was my one and only grandchild. And at this time in my life, he was my purpose, my joy, my happiness. He was my everything. Christian was discovering new things every day and asking a lot of questions that a little three-year-old with a hunger for knowledge would ask. He was learning his numbers. He was learning his primary colors with blue being his favorite, his ABCs, how to color pictures and stay in the lines. He was able to recite nursery rhymes, but most importantly, he was learning how to express himself. As Christian's Nana, I was looking forward to him starting kindergarten and all the excitement and joy that he will experience on that first day. I was looking forward to years and years of birthdays and Thanksgivings and Christmases with him. And with the Lord's will, I was looking forward to his prom and his graduation from high school. I was looking forward to watching him grow into a beautiful young man and getting many beautiful and precious hugs and kisses from him. You took all that away from me. What kind of fear did my grandson, Christian, impose on you that you felt that abusing him and ultimately killing him was your only purpose? Why couldn't you see how that little boy just wanted you to love him and to be his friend? Mr. Harville, I hope and pray that every single day of your life, you will feel and experience the unimaginable pain, heartache, anguish, and suffering you have inflicted on me and my family. I hope and pray that every time you close your eyes and you find a moment of peace, that you will see my grandson's face and hear his laughter. I hope and pray that you will never, ever forget my grandson, Christian Alexander Paz. I pray that you will find forgiveness from Almighty God for killing my grandson, Christian Alexander Paz. Thank you, Your Honor. With that, the hearing concluded abruptly, and Logan was remanded back to the Bear County Jail to await his transfer to state prison. He has since been transferred to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Bird Unit in Huntsville to serve his sentence. I had the privilege of speaking with Jennifer, who is a fiercely protective mom and grandma and a force to be reckoned with. She gave a tremendous amount of insight into the trauma and the subsequent healing process her oldest two grandchildren have undergone since the death of their beloved baby brother. My guest on today's episode is Jennifer Owens, Christian's grandmother. Thank you so much for joining me, Jennifer. Thank you. So I've been following Christian's story since, you know, back in February of last year. And uh, it's such a sad and tragic thing that happened to him. But I know he's more than what happened to him. So I'm glad you're here and and we can actually talk about who Christian was because he sounds like just an amazing child. Oh, he definitely was an amazing, amazing little boy. He was so much, (laughs) so much fun. He was so much joy. He was so curious and as eloquent as a three-year-old could be. He could say excavator and the way he said it, he had a little bit of a speech impediment. It was really cute. He would say excavator. (laughs) He kind of made up his own words like, from the moment he started making sounds, he had a blanket that I have now. Uh, he he actually stole the blanket from me. I bought it to go across the back of my couch. <laughs> and it, it was the softest blanket he had ever felt. So he decided he should have it. You know, the grandbaby wants it. The grandbaby gets it. Right. But he renamed it from blanket to Bonnier. And to this day, it's known as the Bonnier. So he loved trucks. Big trucks, big machinery. I had uh, 
abusers groom their their victims. I groom my grandchildren and my children to follow their dreams and smash their goals and cheer them on. I had already started with his fascination with the heavy machinery and everything, started talking to him about being an engineer. So, and we live in Bryan College Station where Texas A&M is, and that's a great school to get an engineering degree from. So I was getting him pumped for that direction too, from the time he could understand English effectively. (laughs) That's awesome. That's the kind of support, you know, I wish every child had just, you know, from the very beginning, know what you love and go for it. Exactly. He sounds like he was a very smart little boy, too. Very smart. He was extremely intelligent. He he was fascinated with colors also. He wanted to know everybody's favorite color. And then you see him for a long time, and he would have remembered meeting you. And you would say, do you remember what my favorite color is? Because we tested him several times. And he remembered everybody's favorite colors. One time. That was all he had to hear it was one time. So if he wasn't an engineer, he'd be an artist of some kind. Or <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like he really loved his family. Yeah. Um, first two years of his life, they pretty much lived here. For the very first year, they had a house a couple of miles away from where I'm sitting now. And they wound up moving in here with us into my home. And uh, they lived with us for another year. And then the whole family packed up and they moved to San Antonio. They got evicted from an apartment. And when I say they, I'm talking about my daughter and Christian's father. And they were together staying in a friend's home. Well, they were supposed to have taken care of some fines and tickets before they left. And they did not. So a warrant was put out for their arrest. And the police found them, you know, and they got arrested. And they had Sarah's three kids at that point with them? Correct. This was before Christian's killer ever came into the picture. So Sarah and Sam both got a vacation at the County Hooskow. I got a call at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning from my daughter's friend saying, come get the kids or I'm going to turn them over to the state. And I was like, I'll be right there. Give me three hours because that's how far away they are. So I drove immediately. I stopped by my husband's job, told him what I was doing, told him I wasn't going to be home when he got home, and that when I did get home, the kids were going to be with me. So I drove to San Antonio, and I don't know if you've ever seen a look of relief on a toddler's face, but my grandson looked at me, recognized me, and immediately his whole countenance changed, you know, because Gemma was there. That's amazing that you have that presence for him. Yeah. Um, He lived with me from the summer. It was July of 2018 that his parents got arrested. So he lived with me through February or March of 2019. And then I took him home to San Antonio with his parents. And I kept the older two kids. And uh, I took the older kids home in May. They were there for seven months. I see him in October of 2019. He wants to come home with me, and I had to tell him no. The last time that I saw him, my son was coming home from the Navy for leave, and it was my birthday, so it was in October of 2019, right before Christian's birthday also, and my son was going to be home for 10 days, and he wanted to come with me because my house was home. You know, he could go to his mom's house, but my house was home. And he said he wanted to come home with me. And so I talked it over with my husband and I talked it over with my son. Because at the time, I was working in a job where I wouldn't have been able to take him with me. So my son would have had to keep him while I was at work. And my son was like, Mom, I'm on vacation. I really don't want to have any responsibilities right now. And my husband said, no, we got too much going on right now. Let's plan for another time. Well, they had plans for Thanksgiving, and by Christmas, Logan was in the picture. Actually, Logan was there at Thanksgiving, too. Yeah, it was a crazy fast breakup and change. Sam moved out, Logan moved in, and it was just that fast. And I was like, what are you doing? And she's like, 
it's my life. It's my business. And I'm like, okay, is he good to the kids? Oh, yeah, we go and do this and we go and do that. And I don't think there was really any problem at the time. And she has known Logan through her father's family most of her life. So she felt like he was somebody she could trust. Yeah, and if he'd never shown her any any reason to be concerned at all, and she would really, I mean, who would think? Well, supposedly he had other girlfriends that had children, and there was never an issue. I don't buy that for one flipping minute. Dude set off red flags for me from the beginning, and she didn't listen. She was worried about hurting his feelings, and I'm more along the lines of, fuck a motherfucker's feelings, I'm going to protect my babies. And I told her, if he's not right. There is something about him that is off. And then he started bitch button when I called. First, he had her phone and he was hitting the reject button every single time I called. So then I would send her a message on Facebook and, hey, you need to give me a call at your earliest convenience. And I don't put up with a lot of bullshit. There's no reason to play games or lie or anything else. Just shoot straight with me. And if you tell me it's none of my business, fine. Then it's none of my business. I can respect that. But she opted to go that route of it's none of your business. Okay, don't put me in a situation where it becomes my business. And tell him that he is not allowed to reject my phone call. He can hand you the phone if he doesn't want to speak with me and you're busy. I don't mind leaving a message. But every single time I call, it doesn't even ring a full time and I'm the call's rejected. Okay. She was like, he's shy, mom. He doesn't want to talk to you. He never did answer any phone call from me. Right around the time school started in the 2019-2020 school year, my daughter had gotten another cell phone and given the kids one for while she was at work and they were home with Logan. And they would call me. Well, my granddaughter would. She would call me all the time. And I thought she thought, that's how teenagers are supposed to be. She's going to try to emulate that. And she would just talk to me while I was fixing dinner or whatever. Never said anything. It never occurred to me what was happening. Yeah. And, and living three hours away and never really seeing them, it's there'd be no way to tell. My daughter who was working at a call center, literally maybe a block and a half from their house. In fact, when he called her the night he hurt Christian, and said Christian's been found unresponsive, which is what he heard the paramedics say, because I got to give the guy this. He did call 911 when he realized there was a problem. To be quite honest, I would have expected him to bolt and leave the kids. So he did call 911, and he called Sarah at work. She did not even, she had kicked off her shoes under her desk. She didn't put her shoes on. She didn't stop and get the car. She ran to the house. And got there as the ambulance was loading Christian up. He groomed my grandchildren. He groomed them to not only not tell anybody at school or not tell me, but also to not tell their mother. Sarah at the time was probably her own worst enemy because she wanted everything to be okay so desperately. And to be quite honest, my daughter is an uber mommy. Like she is all about her babies, always has been. She's had some bouts of depression and she's made some not good choices, but she has always been all about her kids. If you could see her talk to her children, the way she was with Christian, well, with all of the babies, actually, if it hadn't been for the crappy men in her life, her kids would have grown up so happy and well-adjusted she is an awesome mommy and her crappy choice in men concerning Logan literally cost her everything. Oh, that's terrible. It really is. And and you can even see, you know, just in the pictures of, of her with Christian, he looked absolutely smitten with her. You know, he was very content with his mommy. Yes, he was. And it looked like he was just right at home in Sarah's arms. Absolutely. All his life. He he had never been very far away from, I mean, within arm's reach of someone who adored him his entire existence. And some of the things that my older grandchildren have told me about how Logan groomed Christian, I have to sit there and listen to my grandchildren and be supportive. And then I go and do what every mom does and cry in the shower. 
because it's so devastating. One of the things the kids told me is shortly after spanking Christian or correcting a behavior in an abusive manner, it was always abusive. It was never done with love. He didn't love Christian. He was jealous of Christian, I think. He got too much of Sarah's attention. Exactly. Not only that, but Christian's father was still co-parenting with Sarah. Oh, and he couldn't handle that either. No, he could not. And he was still hard on the other kids because they also got a lot of Sarah's attention. But mommy has been and is and it will always be one of their favorite people. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm so glad that she, she still has that with them. She does. Now, my husband and I are about to adopt the oldest two of her children. But one thing that I have kind of pissed CPS off with through this whole thing is that I refused to turn my back on my daughter. She's still my kid. Do I have anger? Oh, yeah, I do. I certainly do. I'm angry that she stayed as long as she did. The very first time she thought he was too harsh on her kids, she should have showed him the door. But I can't shit all over her in this either. She made her choices. She made her decisions. And she lives with it. And there are days when we call each other over video chat on Facebook and just cry to each other and with each other. A normal progression of grief for our family is to be together and be around each other. And with all of the roles with CPS and and me having the kids and her and everything else, that was taken away from us. So she's not allowed to be around them at all? Not until after the adoption. And then it's at my discretion, you know. And I have no doubt in my mind that she's not going to hurt her kids. My concern would be decisions to keep them safe. Because like I said a while ago, I don't give a fuck about hurting anybody's feelings. I don't care. You know, I'll apologize later or I'll have been right. Either way, I don't care about hurting anybody's feelings. If I see you snatch somebody that I love about in a, a wrong way, if I see you speak to them in the wrong way, I will correct you. And if I hurt your feelings, too fucking bad. There was one time that I was talking to my granddaughter And I heard Logan in the background talking to somebody like they were full-grown men in the oil field, for lack of a better way to put it. Fuck was used like a comma. It was every other word. And I was like, I know he is not speaking to my grandchildren that way. I asked my granddaughter, I said, "Is, is mommy there? And she said, no, she's at work. I was like, put the phone on speaker. And I told him about himself. I was like, you need to watch your mouth. I said, granted, all of us have potty mouths and everything else. And when I'm angry, it'll really come out. But you need to watch your mouth around my grandchildren. They don't need to hear all that. He got pissed off and he told her snitches get stitches and made her stand in the corner for way too long of a time. He would smack. So that taught her not to tell. Mm -hmm. And their mother would see something that was off or whatever when she came home from work or or the next day after the kids came home from school or the next morning or whatever. And she would ask about it. Well, what happened with this? Why is this like this or whatever? Where's that mark from or whatever? And he would be standing over her shoulder looking at him and flaring his nostrils at him. They were terrified of him. After he would, his version of discipline, my grandson He would smack Christian in the head and say, am I a good person? And if Christian said anything other than yes, he would get smacked in the head. And when I heard that, I'm sitting there listening to my grandchildren and I'm like, I am so sorry that he experienced that, that you saw that. That's horrible. I can't imagine what that was like for you guys. And I've never, never once said if you had told me because I don't want them to blame themselves. Absolutely. My oldest grandson did the forensic interview after Christian's death, and he answered all the questions the interviewer had for him and gave a narrative of his version. And then he looked at the interviewer, which was this giant buff dude in a Mr. Rogers sweater. I don't know how to explain him, but that's what he looked like. And he was young. So, you know, the kids would have thought, oh, he's cool. He's young like us, you know, whatever. He uh, told them that... He didn't want him to feel sorry for him, so he was done speaking. 
So the whole, I'm sorry you experienced that doesn't resonate with my eldest grandchild. He's kind of like me in that as far as hurt and feelings. Um, he doesn't give a shit if you're sorry. Your being sorry doesn't do anything to change anything. So what good does it do? And I'm not quite sure where he got that because he wasn't quite that cold when he left my house in May of 2019. He's been in trauma counseling. My granddaughter just graduated from her counseling program and had taken a break for a little while because he kept saying, I don't want to talk about it. And then he said something that was concerning to me. So I called his counselor and told her what was going on. And she said, yeah, let's let's bring him back in. And he's been working very hard with her again to try and, and get through this. People don't realize what it takes to rebuild a child that has been hurt like that. If Christian had had lived, the doctors told us he would have been a vegetable. But, you know, that didn't stop me from crawling in that bed with that baby and whispering in his ear. If you just wake up, Gemma will bring you home with her. You can come with me. I'll take you home. You always have to hope. I did until they unhooked him. I had hope. Even after the doctor said there's nothing. He didn't deserve any of that. And those kids didn't deserve any of that. And Sarah didn't. Bad decisions aside, we've all made those. But you never expect a bad decision to lead to something like this. No. And she never did. She never, never would have thought that he would do something like this to her child or she wouldn't have left him. And I, t I told her, I said, you know, if you had if you had been honest with me about you having problems with him being rough on the kids while she was there, she saw things and the things she saw while she was there and he was tempering it was enough to cause her to have knockdown drag out fights with this dude. Now, he, she swears that he never raised a hand to her. But the kids told me just the other day, um, you know how people flex their shoulders and move real fast to try and get someone else to flinch? Mm -hmm. They told me that Logan used to do that to Sarah all the time. Just to intimidate her. Yeah. He really sounds like a nightmare of a person, especially coming across like Mr. Trustworthy. Oh, you've known me your whole life. Right. He is the biggest piece of shit I've ever had the misfortune of meeting. And with any luck, will ever meet. Oh, yeah. From your mouth to God's ears. Woo! He did get transferred to prison from the county jail yesterday. I hope his first night in prison was a painful one. Oh, yeah. No sleep for him and uh, plenty of new friends, let's say. Yeah. I I'm hoping, I'm very hopeful that the guards made sure to tell the other prisoners or say it loud enough for them to hear what he was in there for. Yeah, I, I want to believe that what everyone says is true, that they don't fare well when they've harmed a child. Yeah, well, considering the fact that my husband's a felon and has done time, he, he told me that that is true. So <laughs> that's that's kind of how I feel about it. To be quite honest, I don't expect him to last long. He doesn't deserve to spend another minute in any kind of comfort again in his life. The I things agree. he did are just too egregious and, and outside the realm of what humanity should encompass. He's destroyed so many people who are now having to rebuild everything, like you said. And trauma work is not easy, especially for little people. Right. Little people who don't have the words to really let people know how they feel or what they're dealing with or what they're going through. My precious grandbaby did not deserve what happened to him. I don't think any child does. Absolutely. And being in foster care and everything that, that I've done to keep my family together, I've learned about some of these kids that have grown up with parents like that their entire existence. The, the stories are horrendous. They're, they're just absolutely breathtaking in the worst way. I read these stories and I find myself holding my breath. And I think about Christian and I find myself holding my breath like it'll ease the pain somehow, but it doesn't. It doesn't. No, it's just so hard to process. You know, you can imagine how awful it would be for you, but for someone so small and innocent, it's unthinkable. Well, the one thing that goes through my mind constantly and it, it is all I can do to keep from screaming, just screaming and not stopping is I wonder what his last conscious thoughts were.
you know, I, I said that in my impact statement, and it's true. It's something that I have thought about many, many times. You know, did he know that he wasn't going to see mommy again or his brother and sister? He didn't really know the twins because they haven't been around very much since they went with their father. You know, I wonder if he knew that he wasn't going to see Gemma and Grumpus again or Uncle Alex or Aunt Catherine. You know, these are all the people that knew him and love him. And his Nana, Sam's mom, I check on her every now and then and she checks on me. But Christian was her only biological grandchild. Both of your statements were just heartbreaking. You know, I've heard a lot of a lot of these stories and a lot of victim impact statements, but I was in tears through the whole thing. Both of you are incredibly strong to have been able to sit there and, and speak to him like that. Well, Connie originally was going to speak for both of us. And then my husband and I started talking and Sarah and I were talking the whole time. And I reached out to Sam and asked him if there was anything that he wanted me to say. He didn't answer. But I asked the kids, and at first my granddaughter looked absolutely terrified. No, I don't. I don't want to say anything to him. I was like, "Baby, you don't. You don't have to say anything to him. I will say it for you. Is there anything you want me to let them know about what life is like without Christian?" And you know, she said, "It's really lonely without him." Christian was the one that always started the dance party. He was the one that always, you know, come on, let's go to the pool. Let's go do this. Let's go do that or whatever. And the kids were were all for it. And they would send him to ask because they knew nobody could tell the baby no. Uh, (laughs) It's just not possible. And to be quite honest, I'm not real good at telling any of them no. (laughs) If they need something, if they want something, if there's some way that I can make it happen, I do. And my husband actually gets on to me about that. He's like, you have to be mom now. You can't be grandma. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to turn it off. I don't want this demotion. I don't want any of this. Yeah. All I want is for my family to be safe. And um, it was really hard to see All the family um, and my mother's generation, they all said the same thing. Everybody said the same thing. You hear about this stuff on the news and it breaks your heart for those families and you never expect it to happen in your own. And then it does and your whole world turns upside down. Upside down, inside out. The internal screams don't ever stop. And there are times when I have to just leave the house and go drive so that I can scream till my throat is raw and I come home and I can't speak for the next two days, which I'm sure everybody in the house loves. But <laughs> it, it's it's unfair. It's fucking wrong. And I'm so sick and tired of people not listening to their instincts. I'm so sick of everybody having to tiptoe around shit because it might trigger or hurt somebody's feelings. And and I'm just, I'm not built that way. I'm just not. That's a very good sense of self-preservation, I think. And I've said it for a while. I really feel that if our kids got more education on relationship red flags as children, as middle schoolers, as high schoolers, we could avoid some of this. You know, if they knew what they were supposed to be looking for and knew what was wrong about relationships and what not to accept, then maybe we could avoid tragedies like this. It's something that I really hope to work on someday is is getting that type of a program put together. Well, that that's actually so with taking care of my grandchildren, I had to get foster certified. I had to get certified through CPS. I had to get all of this stuff done, jump through all these fiery hoops, wearing gasoline drawers, trying to deal with my own grief and deal with the baby's trauma. And I stumbled across this program by Karen Purvis and a couple of other child psychologists. She's deceased now, God rest her, but it's called TBRI. It's Trust-Based Relational Intervention. And there are online classes people can take. And through learning about how to help my grandchildren past their trauma, I have tried to get my daughters to do this as well. I've talked to my mother and her twin sister, my aunt, about it. And please, you guys, look into this. We can start healing the generational trauma now to where we don't think it's okay for people to be mean 
to us, to our children, to our pets, to our motherfucking plants, even. Right. That's awesome. It's good to know about. I hate that my daughter and Sam are going to have to live with this. And they started counseling, but didn't fit. Well, Sam never started. Sarah started it, but she didn't finish it. She doesn't see the point. And I'm like, if you don't do the work, you're not going to see the point. And you're just going to stay in your misery and depression. And if I don't feel like you're safe around the kids, then I can't let you be around them. Yeah. Yeah. You have a lot of hard jobs and you're wearing so many hats right now. Yeah. It's... It's not fair. And and none of you should be dealing with any of it. And as much as it's worth, I am so sorry that you've had to go through it all. And, and especially that Christian had to lose his life. It's so unfair to all of you. It is. It, it really is. And nobody would have chosen this. Nobody would have chosen to live like this. But the healing that has come about because of this has been a huge gift for my grandson. That's kind of how I have to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's something good has to come of it. And I'm glad you have that, you know, that you're able to, to heal. Some people never do. It's just necessary. It's necessary for young women who find themselves in, in my daughter's position to trust their instincts. And if your instincts are wrong, fine, apologize later. But trust your instincts. If something doesn't seem right about a potential significant other, buy it. There are 8 billion people in this world. And if that one don't work out, the next one will come along shortly. Trust me, just let them go. Yeah, his feelings are not worth the alternative. That's for sure. Exactly. I, I just, I can't scream that from the heavens enough. And it's something that has kind of become my mantra with my children. And my husband, bless his heart, he has been just an absolute rock for me through this. Christian was his first grandbaby from scratch. All the rest of them were here when he came in. So he is not Sarah's biological father. But she came up and was like, I'm pregnant. Five minutes after he came into the picture, I say it was that fast. It wasn't really that fast. Um... But when we were getting ready to get married, my husband has no biological children of his own. And uh, I asked him, I was like, well, what do you want your grandpa name to be? And he goes, oh, my God, I've never thought about it. His name is Chris and he's grumpy and grouchy all the time. And the kids know he's full of soft marshmallow fluff. But we had to work through some fears when they first came back to us because they were all of a sudden afraid of Grumpus when they never had been before. And he looks hard. He looks like he would just be mean as hell. And it's so funny because I walk around with a big old smile on my face most of the time. And I crack jokes all the time. And he's very stoic and, you know, just the exact opposite. I don't know how else to say it. Now, when he does crack jokes, they're one-liners and they're great. But he just very rarely, he's very quiet, very reserved. And the kids were so afraid of him when they first got back. And they had to relearn their grandfather. He's been in the picture long enough that they don't remember life without him. But he and my oldest grandson had to have a a man-to-man, heart-to-heart because of some behavior had done. And Grumpus was correcting the behavior, finding the need behind the behavior and correcting the behavior. And the talk that he had, you know, told him, you know, "I, I, I lied to you because I was afraid. And my husband hasn't spanked a kid. Everything's very calming in our home. It's all geared towards keeping things calm for the kids and for us also. And so he told him, he said, look, buddy, I have two jobs for the rest of my life where you're concerned. That's to love you and to help you be the best person you can be. And part of loving you is keeping you safe. He said, I don't spank you. I don't hit you. I don't yell at you very often. I don't cuss at you. I don't do the things that Logan did. But the kids, just because of him being a man, that was all it took for them to put that on him at first. And it just, my husband, as as stoic and quiet and mean looking as he is, he's a big old softy. You know, he's going to answer the two-year-old's play phone and say, hello, it's for you. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, he's going to do it. And he's tatted up, beard, ball headed, big old biker dude. 
And he's the first one to sit in the driveway and draw with chalk and play with the kids. Well, it sounds like he's doing it all right. I hit the lottery with this dude. (laughs) Oh, good. And I think Sarah tried so hard to make Logan like that for her kids. And it just wasn't. The problem is it takes time to learn someone and trust someone enough to let them be that. Right. They have to prove themselves. Exactly. It's just awful. It's so sad. It is very sad. And I miss Christian so much. And there are times when, you know, out of the corner of my eye, we've lived in this house his entire life. So he is very much a part of this home. I see pops of Christian everywhere because they're still toys. I just dust them every week. They're going to stay out. There's pictures. There's the bonnier. It's back on the couch. And we all take turns cuddling it. Even my big old grouchy looking biker husband. We all take turns cuddling it. You know, he was supposed to be starting kindergarten, like Connie said in her victim's impact statement. He would have been in pre-K this year. Yeah. All he wanted to do was go to school with the big kids. He just was so ready to go to school. He was so pissed off when he didn't get to go. (laughs) (laughs) I've got videos of when he was here with me, when we would play outside and His nap time was over right before the kids got off the bus. And I had it planned that way on purpose. So he would take his afternoon nap and wake up at about 2.30, 3 o'clock. That way he had time to wake up a little bit before his brother and sister got home and then everybody got snacked together. But he would sit out here in my drive. I have a a three-car carport and he would just play play in the sun and the neighbors had cats or dogs or whatever in their yard and he would stick his fingers through the fence and play with them and I've bought so many buckets of sidewalk chalk for my grandkids because I've always encouraged their creativity also and um, Mm -hmm. he would just turn the driveway blue it was his favorite color he would turn it blue and turn himself blue too of course (laughs) And then as soon as they came home, he knew he wasn't allowed to go past the end of the driveway. He would run to them and just bounce 90 to nothing at the end of the driveway, waiting on them to come home. Oh. From the moment he saw the bus, and he was fascinated by the bus because it was a big truck. Of course. (laughs) I think the older kids also have a bit of survivor's guilt also, Mm -hmm. because every time we do something fun for them that's supposed to help them or, or... you know, just a break from the norm. Like here a few weeks ago, we went to the zoo. My daughter bought us tickets during a flash sale to go to the local zoo. So I took them to the zoo and we got to see all the animals and they got sad while we were doing the drive through portion of the zoo because we're sitting here in the car and Christian's car seat is still with us. And, you know, we are driving around and gets real quiet, gets real quiet. And I'm like, what's up, guys? What's going on? And they were just talking about how much he would have loved the zoo. Actually dreamt that we had all gone back and Christian was there. And he was running through the walk part, running from display to display, looking at the animals and feeding the goats and feeding the turtles and interacting with as many of the animals as he could. Wow, she really knew who he was. She was the ultimate big sister. She is such a good big sister that even though she's not the oldest, she's still big sisters. Her older brother, she doesn't know how to turn it off either. You know, all of us are pissed off about the demotion of me from grandma to mom and from mom to sister. And, oh, it's going to start sounding Mm. like we're from some backwoods somewhere. (laughs) And (laughs) we've made jokes about it. You kind of have to do that, though, you know, just dark humor gets you through sometimes. And Oh, and we're all really good at it. Oh, good. <laughs> to quote the guy that spoke at Christian's memorial, we all have a Christian-shaped hole in our hearts. Yeah. And he put it perfectly. And the Christian-shaped hole, there's been some healing, but all it did was scar the sides, you know. It's still the same size. It's still the same shape can never be filled i'm just first of all i'm terrified about feeling this way every day for the rest of my life but it just hurts me so bad for my children and my grandchildren 
who have to feel this way every day for the rest of their lives. And, you know, I mean, we don't shy away from talking about him. We we talk about him as much now as, as we ever did, except for he's never getting up from his nap. He's never getting out of the bathtub in a few minutes. He's never, he's just not here anymore. But he's still so here. Every once in a while, I even think I see him out of the corner of my eye, just a little curly brown head off to the side. And he looks... His facial features, like if you put a a picture of my oldest grandson next to a picture of Christian, their coloring was completely different. Oldest grandson, blonde hair, fair skin, blue eyes. Youngest grandson had that gorgeous olive skin, dark hair, brown eyes. And their facial features are so similar that they look like they could have been the same baby. They look that much like their mom. So. I know what Christian would have looked like at 10. It's still hard, though. I feel cheated. I feel like I've been fucking cheated. You have. Out of a lifetime of happy memories with that baby. And I'm terrified of the future. And I'm just so in love with the past. Oh, my God. If I could turn back the hands of time, I would have gone down there the first time I had a problem with that dude and drag him out by his nostrils and told him, you need to get, get gone. You're not allowed to be here anymore. Somehow or another, my daughter had this huge desire not to hurt this dude's feelings. And he had no such compunction about absolutely destroying all of us. He just had no thought for anyone other than himself. And, and it had the worst possible outcome. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure he was, he was on dope. You can't tell me he wasn't. I saw the mug shot. I look at that dude and I'm like, he he was on meth, he was on opioids, he was on heroin, he was on something. His face was picked apart. He was drawn and skinny. I mean, he looked healthier in the sentencing trial than I've ever seen him. That couldn't have helped his state of mind, but I'm sure the the core of him was still who he proved himself to be. His big thing that he would tell my daughter when they would get into these giant rows about him being harsh with her children. So I'm sure she thought she was protecting them by fighting with him about it. She had to have thought she was protecting them. He would tell her, my father was hard on me and I turned out fine. (laughs) No, bro, you turned out a far sight from fine. Yeah. His family, who some of them are married into my daughter's father's family didn't bother to protect him from his monster either. So he was raised to think that that was okay and that was normal. Not that that excuses anything he did, because it doesn't. We all grow and learn and try to do better if we're decent people. And he didn't do better. And another thing I'm kind of pissed off about is CPS came in and they offered all the resources after the fact. Now, granted, Sarah didn't have any CPS cases prior you know, concerning Christian. She had had other ones before while she was with her ex-husband, but not while she was with Sam or Logan. And Christian had never been involved in a CPS case before. But if the resources that are all of a sudden available after the trauma happens were somehow made available prior to the trauma happening to where single moms felt like they could do it on their own a little bit better, Mm -hmm. it would make a huge, huge difference. It definitely would. Our whole system is so broken. It's backwards in a lot of ways. There's no preventative maintenance. It's all reactive. And I don't know how it could be improved or changed in such a way that would actually make a difference. So many systems we have need to be dismantled and rebuilt from the ground up. But what an undertaking that is. I agree. I think it is an undertaking. And I think that there's too much corruption, greed, and politicking in the leadership positions to do it effectively. But I tell you what, if they got together a board of some other pissed off grandmas like me, some other hurt grandmas like me, or some scared grandmas like I was, I bet you we could come up with some solutions. And not even just grandmas, grandfathers too, moms, dads, You know, take some polls, find out how things could be changed. Everybody bounce some spaghetti off the wall and see what sticks. And from multiple states, too, I think that would be very helpful. You know, everybody talks about the dope fiends and 
you know, these parents are drug addicts and they're just not going to do right because they're not ready to take responsibility for their shit. Maybe if you dealt with the need behind the action, just like they teach us to deal with traumatized children, maybe something different could happen. Hopefully the right person will hear the podcast and run with it. Sarah and Sam have come back together through the tragedy and they're doing, they're doing okay, but I, I worry about them. I would worry a lot less if they would go to counseling, but I can't make them. Just for their own sake, too, you know, just to be able to heal, even though they don't know necessarily what parts need healing. Right. Exactly. Well, I hope all of you are able to find the healing you need, honestly. I mean, you and Chris are doing wonderful. You're doing amazing work with those kids and, and you're you're doing right by them. And I'm just so glad that they have you. I'm so glad I have them, because to be quite honest, if they had gone into foster care, heaven forbid, or if Sarah had been able to take them home or what have you, I would have curled up in my bed and I'd probably still be there. So much pain and to take it and channel it into something positive is the important thing. And What you're doing for your grandkids is incredible. And I'm sure they will appreciate it. I know that when they grow up, they will be thrilled that they have you. I'm so glad we got a chance to do this. Uh, you know, thank you so much for, for reaching out today. And you know, I'm glad that you at least have some resolution and that Logan is where he belongs for the time being. Thank you so much for what you do, because I got to tell you, you told my grandson's story as it happened. You didn't do what the other media outlets did, with the exception of my, my hometown media. KBTX came in and interviewed right after Christian's death. And they tried so hard to get me to talk to the folks in San Antonio, but I didn't know them. And I wasn't comfortable with that. But you told the whole story and you didn't just, okay, well, that's the news today and then let it drop. And I appreciate that more than you could possibly imagine. Because I am Christian's voice. You are Christian's voice. My daughter, Sarah, is Christian's voice. My daughter, Catherine, my son, Alex, his brother and sister are his voice. His other brothers that even though they didn't know him very well, they understand that he's gone and they know who he was to mommy. And they will know later in life also. My husband is Christian's voice. Nana, who is Connie, Sam's mom, she is Christian's voice. And as long as we're all being Christian's voice, his story is heard. It's heard correctly. That's what matters. I'm so glad that you've been so candid and that you've told us so much about Christian because I have a very good understanding of what a special baby he was. What a great kid and what a blessing he was. So thank you for that. Thank you for giving me that and, and for sharing him with the world. A lot of people kind of look at stories like this and think of it as a true crime story. It's not. It's a human being, you know, and they're whole people. They were tiny, but they were whole people. The tiny human aspect is so many times forgotten when you hear a true crime story. This actually happened to us. It's real. It's your life. We can't forget that. It's your life and it was Christian's life. I can honestly say that I loved him the best I could while he was here. He never wondered for a moment if he was cherished. Huge thank you to Jennifer for speaking so openly and candidly with me about her family and the healing path she, her husband, Sarah, and the two oldest children are following. We don't often get to hear from the surviving children of these tragic stories, and I know I've learned a lot from what Jennifer had to say. I also want to thank her for sharing so much about her precious grandson, Christian. I know how strongly Jennifer feels about turning what happened to Christian into a learning experience for others as well, so I can't stress enough Jennifer's most important message. Trust your instincts. If something seems off about the person you're dating, follow your gut. Your mind and your heart can mislead you, but your lizard brain probably won't. And even if it does, it's better safe and single than sorry, grieving a lost child, and full of unshakable regrets. I do have one more thing to report before I end the episode, and this is wonderful news. Last week, the adoption process was finalized, meaning Christian's two older siblings were officially adopted by their grandparents, Jennifer and Chris. Because of this, Sarah and her kids are no longer restricted by CPS from seeing each other. I'm so happy for all of them that their whole family can be together again, 
and I can't imagine a more loving, devoted couple to raise these kids than Jennifer and her husband. Now to end the episode, let's talk about Christian, whose obituary reads, He was such a beautiful baby and always curious. Christian loved to be around his family and was very strong-willed as any youngest child needs to be. He also enjoyed telling jokes and had a knack for it, and he knew it. He would always end his joke with, I funny, Mommy and Daddy. We will miss Christian's hugs. He loved to hug and would dish out hugs to anyone once he got to know them a little. We anxiously await the day when we are reunited with him, enjoy those hugs again, and hear him say those sweet words, I love you more, Mommy and Daddy. Jennifer sent me a video clip of Christian's little voice with a message for her, and it's just the sweetest thing. I love you, Jimbo. Can I give her a kiss? Mm. Mm. <laughs> My heart is beyond broken for this family. I wish them all peace and healing, and I can promise them one thing. Christian Alexander Paz will never be forgotten. My sources for this episode were KSAT, My San Antonio, News 4 San Antonio, KBTX, KENS 5, KTXS, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, Facebook, GoFundMe, The Daily Beast, The Philly Voice, People, Telemundo San Antonio, The Hillier Funeral Home, The Bear County 175th District Court Livestream, Sarah Lang, and Jennifer Owens. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.